Well, if you're like the Schuster family, then when it comes time for Christmas, you might pull out the old DVD or stream one of three movies, at least in our household it's one of three movies. It's either It's a Wonderful Life, Miracle on 34th Street, or A Christmas Carol. Anybody else tend to watch one of those at Christmas time? Yeah, a few of you? Well, it's been a while, actually, since we have watched A Christmas Carol. We tend to get through It's a Wonderful Life for sure every year, but A Christmas Carol, Charles Dickens, a classic. A story whose protagonist, as we know, is Ebenezer Scrooge, an embittered, uh, miserly soul whose particularly, particular disaffection with Christmas is... Is this a season of giving? And the plot, as we know it, is this Scrooge character will encounter three ghosts, the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future. And these supernatural encounters will eventually cause him to repent. And then as we watch, we will see him transformed from stony hearted Scrooge to a selfless, caring individual. We might say that at the beginning of the story, his name Scrooge uh, fits him well. And then we can also say that by the end of the story, his character better exemplifies his other name, Ebenezer. Ebenezer Scrooge. And this name Ebenezer comes from the Old Testament. It actually comes from our text this morning. And we're going to see and, and, and learn a lot about this name Ebenezer. Um, and, and from this, I have a proposition for you this morning. I don't do this every week, but I'm going to do it this week. Here's your proposition. A triumph of supernatural proportions through the help of God as a response to true repentance. We can triumph through the help of God as a response to true repentance. Let me read 1 Samuel chapter 7. If you have your Bibles with you, I encourage you to follow along, or you can follow along with the text up here on, on the screen. 1 Samuel chapter 7. We're going to read through the whole chapter. Here we go. And the men of Kiriath Jerem came and took up the ark of the Lord and brought it to the house of Abinadab on the hill. This is verse 1. It's probably not on here. And they consecrated his son Eleazar to have charge of the ark of the Lord. Here we go, verse 2. From the day that the ark was lodged at Kiriath Jerem, a long time passed, some twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And Samuel said to all the house of Israel, If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you, and direct your heart to the Lord, and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the people of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtaroth, and they served the Lord only. Then Samuel said, Gather all Israel at Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered at Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the people of Israel at Mizpah. Now when the Philistines heard that the people of Israel had gathered at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the people of Israel said to Samuel, do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel took a nursing lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. But the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines and drew them into confusion. And they were defeated before Israel. 
And the men of Israel went out from Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and struck them as far as below beth -car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen and called its name Ebenezer. For he said, Till now the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and did not again enter the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. The cities that the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel from Ekron to Gath, and Israel delivered their territory from the hand of the Philistines. There was peace also between Israel and the Amorites. Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life, and he went on a circuit year by year to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mizpah, and he judged Israel in all these places. And then he would turn, return to Ramah, for his home was there. And there also he judged Israel, and he built there an altar to the Lord. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of the word. The title of our message this morning is, When Things Get Bad. When Things Get Bad. And they do, for all of us at some point. So when things get bad, the first thing we need to know, and it's easy, is that we need the Lord. Now, it may seem to odd to you that I have chosen to start with verse 2, even though I read verse 1. I doubt anybody's Bible's formatted that way, but the reason why I've chosen to start with verse 2, even though that's where we last, uh, left my last message, is because it sets the stage for what we're about to talk about. It, it's the, the scene, the setting for the story. And we read that a long time past, some 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. In other words, things have been rough for Israel for a long time. For 20 years, they've been in a tough place. I wonder how many of us in this room can relate to that. How many of us can relate to being in a tough place for a long time? And Samuel knows. He knows something important, and I want you to listen to this. Samuel knows that just because someone is sad or someone is mournful, it doesn't necessarily mean that that person is repentful. It doesn't mean that they're repentant. So Samuel is going to call the people of Israel to repentance. And in so doing, we get the gospel in miniature. And I love this when we find the gospel in the Old Testament. You know, it's all throughout the pages of the Old Testament. But boy, not so often does it come so blatantly obvious as it does right here in this chapter. Look at this. And Samuel said to all the house of Israel, If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtoreth from among you, and direct your heart to the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you. This is the gospel. Let's talk about this. Because it begins with repentance. Do you want to know what it what it's like to be right with God, to be good with God, it starts and begins with repentance. Let me tell you what repentance is not. Repentance is not feeling sorry. Think of it this way. I, I know I've shared with you before that the Hebrew word for repentance is the word shoe, which means to turn around and go the other way. So I'm walking to the cross, And as I get there, I say to myself, I'm sorry. That's not repentance. Repentance would be this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Lord. And then we come back to him. That's what repentance is. But so many times we think it's just saying we're sorry. And that's only part of it. What is repentance? Repentance is a change of heart. Repentance is to stop and turn around and go back. It's to return to the Lord. And so here, Samuel says to the house of Israel, return to the Lord with all of your heart. Be truly repentant. Give your heart to the Lord, and then serve him. Now, it's interesting. 
Because the Hebrew word for serve can also mean worship. In fact, for example, when Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go that they might serve the Lord. That means that they may go and worship the Lord. And here Samuel says, give your heart to the Lord, turn to him and serve him. And then he will do what? He will deliver you. Oh, another word for that would be save you, rescue you. So let's see what we have in these verses. We have, look, return to the Lord with all of your heart. Put away your idols, the other things that you worship. Worship only the Lord and serve him only. And he'll save you. He'll deliver you. That's the gospel in miniature right here in the book of Samuel. And how does Israel respond? They respond with genuine repentance. It's one of their better moments in the Old Testament. Because Israel, Israel as we know, they're a stubborn people. And so oftentimes they hear prophets speak and they do nothing at all. But in this moment, they do repent. It's a great moment. Have you done that? Have you repented and made peace with God? Because that's the first step. That's the first step. Becky and I were on vacation this last week, as you know. And uh, we, had, we had a fun night uh, where we went and saw a magician. A magician slash illusionist. And this guy was really good. I must say, we've done this a few times as, as a family in the past. Um, we've, we've seen uh, ma ma uh, magicians or illusionists. And this guy gets up there and he begins to tell us what the difference is between uh, a magician and an, an illusionist. He says a magician is, is more sleight of hand, right? So uh, a true magician learns the trick of the trade where they can, and he did fancy stuff like whip out a deck of cards in his hand and whip out a deck of cards in his hand and do this and they're gone and then he'd whip them out again and I stood there like everybody else just trying to figure out how he's doing it, you know, rather just sit and enjoy it. Uh, so he's doing this sleight of hand, so he was a true magician. But then he talked about it, an illusionist, which is someone who, it looks like something is happening, but it's not. And it struck me that Satan is an illusionist. He's very, very clever. And he can have us believing an illusion. For example, he can have us believing that we're in fact good with God when we're not. That's the most dangerous illusion. Jesus made it very, very clear in Luke chapter 13, uh, Luke 13, verse 3. Unless you repent, you will perish. It is so straightforward. It is so simple. It destroys this illusion that if we're good enough, we'll be with the Lord. Now, the Lord says that's not true. Unless you repent. Repentance is absolutely essential to your salvation. And it's really simple theologically, but it isn't always so simple practically. And that is where a mediator is helpful. And we see in our passage that when things go bad, we need a mediator. We read in verse 5, we read this, Then Samuel said, Gather all Israel at Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. Israel needed a mediator. They needed an intercessor. Israel's relationship with the Lord had been broken, and after 20 years of this, they're walking around miserable. And here Samuel comes and says, I will pray to the Lord for you. Those are great words. Have you experienced that before? Have you ever had someone say to you, I'll pray for you? We lived in Ireland for a long time, as you know, and the Irish people are some of the hardest people to witness to on this planet. They really, really are. Because if you start to talk about God to an Irish person, they'll immediately go, yeah, I know that. I'm good with God. Because most of the Irish are Catholic, and Catholic theology is a little different. It's got some areas that it needs to improve in, a lot of them. And 
The average Irish person thinks, yeah, I'm good with God. I don't really need to hear what you have to say. But I discovered that if you want to disarm somebody, and it's not just an Irish person, it could be a person, your neighbor, you find someone who's resistant, somebody who's obstinate, somebody who doesn't want to hear what you have to say, you know what you can say to them? Can I pray for you? I don't have to do it now. I do it at home, but I'll pray for you. That's very disarming. There are very few people, I'm sure there are some, but very few people will say, don't you dare. Don't you pray for me. Most people will be like, uh, sure, sure, whatever you want. Even if they're a little antagonistic, they might say, oh, yeah, if you believe in that thing, but they're not going to get angry at you. Having a mediator is a good thing, and Samuel comes, and he's going to mediate for the people. And they know they need it, because look at what they say. They say, do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us. We need a mediator. We know the power of prayer. Do you? Do you know the power of prayer? Have you seen God answer prayer in your life? I mean, I have. I could stand here all day and tell you the cool things that I have, see, I have seen God do in, in my short lifetime. Some of you are older than me and probably have stacked up a longer list of really cool things you have seen God do in answering your prayer. But not only have I seen it in my own life, I also see it in biblical history. For example, Abraham's servant prayed and Rebekah appeared. Remember that story where Abraham was seeking a wife for his son? Hannah prayed. We just talked about that not that long ago, and Samuel was born. Jehoshaphat prayed, and God defeated his enemies. Hezekiah prayed, and the Lord added years to his life. Mordecai and Esther prayed, and the Jews were saved from annihilation. Believers prayed, and Peter was released from jail. And We could go on and on and on. Seeing in Scripture the answer to prayer, the power of prayer. You should, you should believe in the power of prayer because you have the most amazing mediator. First Timothy 2, 5, for there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, or Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. But now Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood, for he is the one who mediates for us. That's the mediator we have. Someone far greater than Samuel. We have the Lord Jesus himself. And with a mediator like that, well, you can expect God to answer. Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. You know, it's interesting. I have heard this expression so many times in my, in my life. It's it's really cool, the Lord answered my prayer. My friends, the Lord always answers your prayer, 100% of the time. It just may not go the way you want it to. You may have asked for something, and he may have chosen not to give it to you because it wasn't good for you, or he may not have saved you from this dilemma you're in yet. But it doesn't mean he hasn't answered you. I have, I have three boys, as you know, and they all know that growing up when they were kids, if I said something to them and they did not answer me, I would get irritated. Parents know what I'm talking about? Like, I'm sorry, I said something. Did you hear me? Uh-huh. I want more than a uh-huh, but yes, Dad. Yes, Dad. Good boy. Good boy. Yes. The Lord always answers us. In this case, it's very specific. It says, and the Lord answered him. He answered Samuel. And this is an extraordinary moment. In fact, this is the first time that the Lord has, has acted positively towards Israel since the very beginning of 1 Samuel. Hannah prays, the Lord responds and, and gives her a child, but from, from that beginning until now, it has not been good. But what does the Lord do? The Philistines have attacked again, and this is what the Lord does. This is how 
how he answers them. It says, the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion, and they were defeated before Israel. Well, I love this verse at so many different levels. This is, this, I mean, I could, I could just dwell on this all day long. And you might be thinking, well, you're a very boring person then. No, seriously. How many people have caught the thunderstorm last night? Anybody? Yeah, I don't know how you could miss it, right? I mean, unless you were, I don't know, Holland. Did you guys have a thunderstorm in Holland? Oh, that's really too bad. Because we had a great one here in Hamilton. Uh, it was really quite a display. But it was interesting that the thunderstorm that we had last night was rather quiet. Did you notice? I mean, at least it seemed quiet to me. A lot of lightning and flashing going on, right? I mean, I, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm a bit jet lagged, so I was still trying to sleep at 1 o'clock in the morning, and I got light just flashing in my window from this amazing electrical storm that God had uh, whipped up out there. But a really good thunderstorm is loud, is it not? And there's just, I mean, I just love it when you're sitting there, and all of a sudden, like out of the blue comes this crack of thunder that like vibrates the house. Now, one of the things that we missed in Ireland was a good thunderstorm. I, I, it sounds funny, but Ireland just doesn't really get thunderstorms. We get a lot of rain coming through all the time, you know. It's like God's constantly shaking the globe, you know, and, you know, it's bringing down moisture. But thunderstorms were quite rare. I mean, you kids growing up, my boys are all here, all three of them. Like, what? You could probably count on it one hand, couldn't you, how many times you really heard a good thunderstorm growing up in Ireland. So that's one thing I love about Michigan. Nice, loud thunderstorms. You know, they kind of rattle your house. Well, I'll tell you what. What God did this day in an answer to Samuel's prayer must have been the most amazing, amazing thunderstorm. For the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day. There's not a single Old Testament scholar that I know of who would disagree that this is God whipping up this amazing thunderstorm. All the Hebrew language that is in this text is just jumping out at a major, major thunderstorm. And this is not the first time God has done this. God has done this on multiple occasions. So he throws the Philistines into confusion, the Bible says. Now the Hebrew word for confusion is the Hebrew word hamam. Hamam. And hamam, we see it in various places in the Old Testament. Let me give you some examples. In Exodus chapter 14, verse 24, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into Hamam, into confusion. How about Joshua? Joshua chapter 10, the Lord threw them into confusion. There the English makes it really, really clear. Before Israel, who defeated them in a great victory at Gibeon. This next one is really good. Ready? How about this? Judges. At Barak's advance, the Lord Hamamed, rooted Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword, and Sisera abandoned his chariot and fled on foot. The English chooses to say rooted because we get the idea, right? But basically what it is, is the Lord whipped up a thunderstorm and threw them into confusion. Completely destroyed their military tactics, in fact, if you study that text. And what I also love about this, this verse is that there's a hidden polemic. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is that the Lord is doing more than one thing here. Not only is he saving his people, but he's also making a statement against the gods of the Canaanites. This is Baal, the number one god of the Canaanite pantheon. And Baal and Zeus have something in common. They both hold a thunderbolt. Now, in Greek mythology, Zeus actually holds a thunderbolt. But in Canaanite theology, Baal usually holds a staff out of which comes thunder and lightning and power. And so this is why I think this is the way that God chose to deliver the Israelites from the Philistines. And why do I say that? 
I say that because we look back at this earlier verse, and what does it say? Samuel says, if you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away your foreign gods, first and foremost, which would have been Baal. Put away Baal and the Ashtaroth, Ashtaroth being the consort of Baal. Put these gods away and serve the Lord and serve him only. And then he will deliver you. And sure enough, that's what the Lord does. He delivers them with this amazing thunderstorm and lightning and power. And of course, it utterly confuses and roots the Philistines and they flee. You get rid of Baal because you don't need Baal, the Lord says. I am the God of power and of lightning and of storm. I'm creator. You don't need anyone but me. You know, it's interesting. If you've been following our series in 1 Samuel, have you noticed how many times I keep going back to Hannah's prayer? Look at this. She says, in her song, excuse me, her song, she says, those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. He will thunder against them from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. It's interesting how many times going through 1 Samuel, we can keep going back to a verse and Hannah's song. Just interesting. Well, when things go bad, we reap the benefits of living in obedience. First of all, we receive God's help. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen, and he called its name Ebenezer. For till now, the Lord has helped us. Now, Ebenezer, you knew I was going to come to this. Ebenezer, it's an interesting name. Earlier in our, in our study of 1 Samuel, we came across the name Ichabod. Remember Ichabod? Ichabod meaning, where is God's glory? It was a negative name. Eli's daughter-in-law named her son Ichabod. But now we've come across another naming, but this name is very, very positive. It's not negative at all. Samuel decides to call a stone Ebenezer. He sets up the stone. It's going to be a stone of remembrance, and its name is going to be Ebenezer. And whenever they come across that stone, they will remember that God helped them. Because that's what it means. It means stone of help. Think of Ebenezer. Think of the word help. The older ones in this auditorium may recall this classic hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Have, here I raise my Ebenezer. Here by thy great help I've come. Good use of parallelism by uh, Robert Robinson. And I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. And every time the Israelites looked at that stone, they would remember that the Lord helped them. You know what? That was great for the Israelites. But what about us? What about you and me? Do we have anything that can remind us that the Lord has helped us? You know what it is? It's right there. The cross. The cross is to us. And Ebenezer, when we look at the cross, uh, we see the seriousness of sin. When we look at the cross, we see that we need God's help. I don't know what you think of when you see the cross. Some, I'm sure that each of us has a different reaction to it. But... One of the things we can do when we look at the cross is we can be reminded of how God helped us, how the Lord helped us. And if he's willing to die that we might be saved, what else is he willing to do for you? Paul said, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Romans 8.32. So when you're feeling overwhelmed or threatened by the circumstances of your life, Remember, God is your help. Now, it's, it's healthy to have occasions for remembering how God has helped us in our lives. Uh, we do this actually every first Sunday when we 
celebrate communion. Every first Sunday when we celebrate communion, we are, being, we are remembering how the Lord has helped us. And that's a good thing. We should do that often. Let me just encourage you this morning. Let me encourage you, especially you parents, to do this frequently. To frequently take some time with your children and remind them how the Lord has helped you. I think too many times we reserve that for something like Thanksgiving. Oh, I love Thanksgiving because we all get together and we gather around as a family and we talk about how the Lord has blessed us and how the Lord has helped us. Well, why aren't we doing that more often? Study Deuteronomy chapter 6. Study the Shema and how the Israelites were supposed to train and raise up their children. We should be talking about the Lord all the time to our children. I know you want your children to grow up and be those who follow and love the Lord. Well, then you should be regularly talking about him, not just at church on Sunday, but in your home, around your table, before they go to bed at night. And remind them now and then of how the Lord has helped you as a family, how he has helped them. So I encourage you to do that. We also see how our enemy is defeated. We read, as, as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel, but the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day. They were defeated. The men of Israel went out and pursued the Philistines and struck them as far as Beth this is a This is a battle report, by the way. That's what this is. This is a battle report. Now I got the guy's attention, right? They're like, oh, cool, a battle report. Yeah, this is a battle report, but it's a, a theological battle report. I've said before, the Bible's not a history book. The Bible is a theology book. From Genesis to Revelation, it's a book about God. It's a, it's a, good, it's a book about Jesus, and even a battle gets a theological perspective. That shouldn't take away from what happened here. I mean, there was a battle. It doesn't go into details, but there was war here, battle. People dying on both sides, Israelites dying, Philistines dying. Now, we don't get all the details, but what we get is the result. The result is that the Lord defeated Israel's enemies. The real hero of the battle is the Lord. And the real hero of your battles is and will be the Lord. So why would we hesitate to bring him in to our struggles and our challenges? Some of you are facing some unique battles this morning. I know you are. One person who's not here this morning, I, I, I pray for him all the time, Brian. Some of you know Brian. Brian who had to go to jail for a while and I'm going to believe him for a crime he did not commit. He's facing a battle today as he has to go in tomorrow again see if the judge has decided to change his sentence. Right now he's on parole. Will he have to go back in? He doesn't know. That's his battle. Some of you are battling health issues, something going on with your body and you don't know what it is. It's got you a little nervous. Some of you are battling financial uh, battles. Maybe they're of your own doing and maybe they're not. A lot of you are battling relationship issues. It might be with your spouse, it might be with a colleague, it might be with a neighbor or an extended family member. But things aren't good and you're finding yourself in the middle of it all. I can assure you and I promise you that the Lord is telling you this morning he wants to be your help. He wants to help you. But you've got to go to him. You've got to give it to him. Don't leave him out when he's the one you need the most. You know, often in the telling of our stories, we make the mistake of leaving the role of God out of it, out of the retelling. And that's a mistake because the role God is playing in our lives transforms 
circumstances and, and gives us perspective. It gives us perspective. If the average Christian were to tell the story of his or her life and leave out the perspective that God brings, it would change the story. It would change your story. You have a story to tell. But if you leave God out, you're, you're not really telling your story. You're telling a, a strange version of it. Look at the thing that distinguishes a Christian from someone who isn't is seldom the circumstances that we're facing. Did you hear me? The difference between you and, and a friend who doesn't believe in God, the difference between you and that person isn't your circumstances. The same things happen to everyone. All of us get sick. All of us have challenging uh, relationships or difficulties with our job. All of us have similar circumstances. You're not going to be uh, immune from those simply because you're a follower of Jesus. You and your neighbor are going to experience many of the same things in life. The difference, the difference is going to be the role that God is playing in your life. That's the difference. So we need to give theological interpretations, not just to our successes, but also to our struggles. So let me just challenge you with this. When things get bad, when you're facing difficult times, remember this passage. And let me suggest that you start by taking your spiritual temperature. Get out your spiritual thermometer and see where you're at. Do you need to turn back to the Lord? Because that's where you have to start. You have to start by reorienting yourself. Return, as the Old Testament says, to the Lord. And if you find, yeah, actually, I'm already there. Then let's remember this really wonderful two verses from Psalm 112. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. 